so much, Miss Kayla, Miss Sharon, for ministering to us through the music and preparing us for the remainder of the service today. If you have your uh, Bibles this morning, church, if you go with me to Hebrews chapter number 13, the book of Hebrews chapter number 13, I want to look at one verse out of Hebrews chapter number 13 and give us and try to build a thought off this morning of what the Lord has uh, laid upon my heart for us uh, this morning through His Word. Again, thank you, church, for being faithful to be in your place. It's sure good, again, to see each and every one of you on this beautiful Sunday. And uh, so thank you again for your love for your Savior and being faithful to be here uh, today. Let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Our dear, most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for South Valley Baptist Church, where we can come together as a group of believers and make up the body of Christ and Lord that we would just honor and glorify you through the remainder of the service. Thank you for ministering to our hearts and our souls through the music and now Father as we prepare to open and to read your word Father I pray that you take the truth of your word make it applicable to the lives of all that are here today that we hear and open our hearts to receive. I pray that as I stand in your pulpit to proclaim your word that you would use me as your mouthpiece Speak through me the words you want spoken this morning during this time. We love you this morning, Father. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to talk to you this morning for just a few minutes on this thought, the sacrifice of praise. It's amazing to me, and it happens more often than not, it's amazing to me that when I come to a Sunday morning, sometimes a Sunday night service, how I never never know what songs are going to be sung. I don't, Miss Kayla, she prays on that. And she asked the Lord, but it's amazing how that the songs and the things that the testimonies that go line right up to what I'm about to speak on. And I love it when the Lord does that. I love it when the Lord puts the message upon our heart like that and how he leads into this. And so I'd like to talk to you for just a moment this morning on the sacrifice of praise. You know, when you and I think about the word sacrifice and What's the meaning of it? When you, when you stop and think about it, just in asking an average individual, what does sacrifice mean? They may give a definition along the lines of something like this. It's giving something that's valuable to me to someone else. It's maybe me giving something that I have that's valuable to, to the needs or to the help of somebody else. You know, you can think about it. A couple of examples would be you may have heard this. I'll sacrifice some of my time to come help you. Or maybe you've heard someone say, I may sacrifice my seat so that someone else might be able to sit down. And those are true definitions in our day and in our time. But biblically speaking, when you think of the word sacrifice, it has a different meaning. Uh, The meaning that you look at when we see the word sacrifice in the biblical sense is it's the thought as giving an offering to God. It's a thought of giving an offering to God. You see, there there were many laws concerning the giving of the sacrifices of God given to us in the Old Testament. Under the law given to Moses, they were commanded to give several different offerings and sacrifices of offerings to God. You go back and again, let me uh, share with you, please understand, we no longer under the law. We no longer live in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. We live in the dispensation of grace, the church age, so to say. We're no longer under the laws. But the law that was given to Moses for the children of Israel, there was several different offerings and sacrifices that they would make for different reasons. You may have read in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy about the, the travelings of, as God prepares the nation of Israel through Abraham, and as they go through, as Moses leads them and guides them, you will hear of offerings that they gave. And three particular, I see, the first one that we see is the sin offering. The sin offering that was given, and it just simply means this, it was a sacrifice that was intended to make a covering for the sins of Israel. The sin offering that would be given, and a lot of times when you'd see a sacrificial offering given, it would be that of a goat or a ram, a lamb or a sheep or a dove, and the blood of that animal, and the fact of a sin offering, it was intended to make a covering for the sins of the people of Israel. The second offering that you would see in the Old Testament or the law was that of the burnt offerings. These would be sacrifices that would be indicated the desire to fully consecrate oneself to God. This would be the offerings that they would give to to be able to say that I am surrendering, I am giving myself wholly to God, to follow God, to live for God, to love God. And then you would look at the peace offerings. 
The peace offerings that would be given were intended to bring one into a close fellowship with God. They would give this offering and they would sacrifice this animal and the blood would be shed of this animal and it would again be intended for bringing one back into close fellowship with God. To have that walk with God, that life with God. But again, these are offerings that were in the Old Testament under the law. They no longer exist. Why is that? Because we understand this, that the greatest sacrifice, the greatest offering was given through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. And since that time, there's no need for any more sacrifices. There's no need for any more of those sacrifices because the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary for you and for me worked and did it all. It cleanses us of all of our sins. It brings us into a fellowship. It brings us into a relationship with God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want you to look with me, if you would, this morning at Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 15. Follow along reading with me this morning, if you would. And the author of Hebrews says this. It says, By him, speaking of Christ, therefore... Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Can I go through real quickly, give you a little word by word definition and understanding of this verse to maybe better help us understand what the author here is trying to relate to you and I this morning. When you look back at this verse, it says by, and that word by means through. It means it's an active word. It means this, that it's already been done. It's already taken care of by him. By who? By Christ, who was mine and your sacrifice for our sin nature. By him, the Bible says, therefore, and it means this. That word therefore means of a certainty. It means certainly. So what he's saying here is this. He's saying that by him or through him, through Christ, therefore, certainly, you can mark it down. What he continues on to say, let us offer. The phrase let us offer means this. It leads an action now to you and I as a believer in Christ. It means that we are to bring to him. We're to bring something to him. Let us offer. We're to bring to what? The sacrifice. The sacrifice there, if you study the word and you look it up, it means this. It's the act or an action. He says that let us offer the sacrifice, the act, the deed of what? Of praise. The word praise there is the word thanksgiving or thanks. He says to let us offer the sacrifice of praise to who? To God continually. Which means what? Constantly, always, never ceasing, never stopping. You and I as a believer in Christ are to do this. Why? That is the fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit is making confession to God's name. It's by the sacrifice of praise. He says by the fruit of what? Our lips. Giving thanks or acknowledging what? To his name, which is his authority, it's his character, it's his majesty, it's his power, it's his excellence. Can I take this morning real quickly and give you two things out of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 15. I want to share with you this morning, and I ask you this morning with me if you would, to really, really examine yourself in the matter of what we want to speak to you about, the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise. You look back at Hebrews chapter 13 with me in verse number 15. The Bible says this. It says, to him, to Christ, therefore. And the phrase I want to look at is this next phrase. Let us offer the sacrifice. Let us. Who's us? That's you and I that put our faith and trust in Christ. Let us. What does he continue to say there? Let us offer the sacrifice. Can can I share with you again this morning, in the biblical sense, the giving of an offering, the giving of sacrifice and of that praise is this. It's a thought as giving an offering unto God. Go with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2. 1 Peter, chapter number 2. Again, keeping in mind Hebrews 13, 15, where it says this, Let us offer the sacrifice. In 1 Peter chapter 2, I'd like to look at two verses this morning. Verses number 5 and verse number 9. In 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter number 2, Peter is writing here. And I want you to listen to what he says in verse number 9. Talking to believers, he says, Ye also as lively 
stones. Can I stop there for a moment where he says that phrase, lively stones? What he's talking about is not walking outside the door and seeing the rocks talk to us. When he says lively stones, if you study this out, what those words lively stones mean, it means this, living believers. That's you and I that have put our faith and trust. So what he's saying here is you also, as lively stones, as living believers, are built up a spiritual house. As a believer in Christ, you are a spiritual house. How does he say that you and I are a spiritual house? Can I ask you a question this morning? When you and I accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, who comes within of us? The Holy Spirit. To come inside of us to what? To reside with us. We have Him. We are a house. The Holy Spirit comes and He now indwells in us. He is with us from the point of salvation. And so He says there, listen to what He's saying. You also as lively stones or a living believer are built up a spiritual house. Look what He says next. And this is so important in today's message. And holy priesthood. He says, why? To offer up spiritual. The word spiritual means this. It means those who believe in Christ to offer up spiritual sacrifices or acts acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you see here that in 1 Peter 2, uh, chapter 2, verse number 5, he's telling you and I as a believer in Christ, we have the responsibility to offer up what? Praise. To offer up an offering, a sacrifice of praise unto who? Unto God through Jesus Christ. We're to praise Him this morning. We are to give those praise. We are to give that, that sacrifice of praise and give that offering to Him and praise Him and glorify Him for what He's done for us. Now skip over to verse number 9. Listen to what He continues to say in verse 9. He says, But ye are, talking to believers, a chosen generation, a elected generation. Remember what I told you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God in His omniscience, before anything was ever created, before He spoke anything into existence, God knew who would accept Christ and who would not accept Christ. And for those that He knew would put their faith and trust in Christ, He did what? He chose us. He elected us. He did not condemn anybody to hell. It's not His will that any should die and go to hell, but that all should be saved and come to repentance. The fact of the matter is, is that He knew in His omniscience before time who would and who would not. So He's addressing, but you are a chosen generation. Look again, look what He says here. A royal priesthood. Again, what's the word priesthood there? He's talking about there this. He's talking about believers. That's the royal priesthood of those that put their faith and trust in Christ. And holy nation or people. A peculiar people. Now the word peculiar doesn't mean weirdos. Strange. The peculiar people there, if you study that word peculiar, means this, purchased. Have you understand this? That we've been redeemed, we've been bought, we've been ransomed by the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying there. He says you are a chosen generation, an elected folk, a royal priesthood, a holy people, a peculiar, a purchased people. Why? That ye should show forth or publish or declare what? The praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The sacrifice of praise. He's pointing to you and I here in 1 Peter. He's telling and showing you and I that as a believer in Jesus Christ, it is our responsibility, it is our privilege to be able to what? To praise and offer the sacrifice of praise to our God in heaven, to our heavenly Father, and to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To praise them, to honor them. Can, can I give this to you? Look, if you would, back in verse number 9. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This is talking about the believer priest here. You realize this, that we are all priests as a believer in Jesus Christ? We're all priests because why is that? I'm going to tell you how we're all priests. It goes back to the Old Testament. Do you remember in the Old Testament under the law, Moses, as they were leading the children of Israel, and they're wandering, God commanded them to build a tabernacle. There's a great model of this in Miss Lori's Sunday school class if you want to stop by and look at it. A tabernacle, and it had different courts that they could enter into. The priests could go to a certain point. They could go to the inner courts. But listen to me, only the high priest once a year could enter into the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That is where God met with the children of Israel in between the two cherubims on the top of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And only once a year could the high priest enter into the presence of God and to pray for the sins of the people of Israel. 
But let me share something with you folks. We're going to find this out in just a few minutes. Jesus now, we're no longer in the law. We're no longer under the New Testament. Jesus now is mine and your high priest, which makes you an high priest, and we're going to see what he has done for us. And so as we continue and as we look here, I want to show you something this morning. Listen to what my Bible, I read this when it talks about the royal priesthood. It says, in the dispensation of grace, which is where we live at, the dispensation of grace of the church age, it says believers are unconditionally constituted a kingdom of priests. We see that in 1 Peter 2, 9 and Revelation 1, 6. The priesthood of the believer is therefore a birthright, just as every descendant of Aaron was born to the priesthood. The chief privilege of a priest is access to God. Under law, the high priest could only enter the holiest of all, and that but once a year. But when Christ died, the veil, or the type of Christ's human body, was rent so that now the believer priest, you and I, equally with Christ the high priest, have access to God in the holiest. Did you not hear the verses that Kayla read a little bit earlier? That she said this, that you and I, aren't you glad that we now have the privilege to enter into the presence of God and to speak to Him personally? We don't have to have a high priest intercede and stand in for us in the presence of God. It has been made for you and I now as a believer of Christ to come right into His presence and fellowship with Him and pray to Him and speak to Him. Boy, aren't you glad for that today, folks? Let me give this to you. Some of us aren't getting this. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 10, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 10, verses number 19 and verses number 20. Hebrews chapter 10, verses number 19 and verses number 20. The author here of Hebrews, listen to what he says. Having therefore, brethren, or believers, boldness, or an assurance, or a confidence, to enter into where? The holiest, by what? The blood of Jesus. Not through anything we've done, but through the blood of that great sacrifice, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse number 20. By a new and living way, or means, which He hath consecrated, or dedicated for us, that through the veil, that is to say... His flesh. Do you realize why he just said there that you and I now as a believer in Christ have the boldness, the Bible says, to enter into the holiest, into the place where God presides, where God is. Why? How are we able to do that? Through the blood of the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can now go into that. Let, let me give this to you if I can as well. Go back if you would. In verse number 20, he says, By a new and living way. What was that new and living way that has been given for us that we can now enter into the holy of holies? That we can now enter into the presence of God? How was that made affordable to you and I? Go with me if you would to Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter number 27. I want you to look at verse number 51 with me if you would. Matthew chapter 27. As a matter of fact, go back if you would to verse number 50. And this is the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter number 27, verse number 50. And we'll read to verse number 51. In Matthew 27, verse 50, the Bible says, And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and he died. Look what happens immediately in verse number 51. And behold... The veil of the temple was rent in twain or two from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks were rent. You know what that means? The veil where only the high priest could go and nobody else could go into the presence of God. When Jesus took his last breath and said, it is finished, and he died, immediately that great veil that kept you and I from entering into the presence of a holy God was rent from the top all the way to the bottom, being able to say, your high priest, Jesus Christ, has given his life and his body for you, and he has died for your sins, and he has now made a way where you can be saved, and he's now made a way where you can enter into the presence and have fellowship with God the Father and relationship with him today. Thank God for that. And Him being our high priest to do that, that makes you and I as a believer in Christ, a priest, a believer priest through what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. Why? Giving us the right, the ability, and the authority and the privilege to enter into the presence of God and the Father and say, God, I just got to come talk to you. God, I just want to tell you how much I love you. God, I want to say thank you. God, I just want to sit here and just fall at your feet and just sit here in peace and listen to you. And just have that time of fellowship with you, Father. You look and you see the way that was made. We see it in Matthew 27, verse 51. But can I give you another verse, a very familiar verse? It's Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. 
Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. Again, this is all being written to you and I as believers. Understand this, correct? Romans chapter 12, I want you to look at verse number 1. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren. I, I call, I invite you, uh, believers, by the mercies of God that ye present, that you exhibit your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice. Offering unto God what is holy, acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. Folks, can you grab hold of this this morning? The opportunity and importance of the sacrifice of praise is so important to a believer in Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of praise, the offering unto God that you and I give. And being able to come, as he says here, let us offer the sacrifice. Can, can I help you this morning and help you see what the sacrifice was? And what the sacrifice cost? Go to Hebrews with me, chapter number 9, if you would. Hebrews, it says in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 15, let us offer the sacrifice. We understand this this morning. How many understand that Jesus was our sacrifice? Jesus died in our place. He was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. He was the one that stood in mine and your place. All right, He was our sin penalty for you and for me. Look, if you would, Hebrews chapter number 9, verses number 11 and verse number 12. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, it says, But are now Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect or complete tabernacle or habit, habitation, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. If you write in your Bible where he says, not of this building, the word building there means this, it means creation. What it's saying to you and I is this, Jesus Christ was not created. We understand the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was not created, folks. He's been from before everything was, and He'll be till the end, when everything's in the end. Amen. He's going to be all the way through. The Bible tells us this. Look at verse number 12 with me. He says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal or forever redemption or ransom for who? For us. The sacrifice of praise. Can I ask you something this morning, folks? Is he worthy of mine in your praise today? You better believe it absolutely without a shadow of a doubt. But you understand it's an offering. It's a sacrifice of praise. It's an offering unto God. It's coming before him, honoring him, by praising him, worshiping him to the fact of understanding what God did for us and what Christ has done for us and the love that God had for us in this. Look with me, if you would, in the same chapter. Look at verses 24 down through verse number 26 with me. Verse number 24 says, For, or indeed, Christ is not entered or come in into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures or the representatives of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear or to exhibit or manifest in the presence of God for us. We understand that's where he's at. 25, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. You know what it's saying? Jesus doesn't have to come back and die again and again and again. He did it once. It was final. It was completed. It was satisfactory in the eyes of God the Father what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. Then verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now... Once are entire in the end or the completion of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Man, you stop and understand back in our text, the Hebrews 13, 15, what the author is trying to get you and I to see. Let us, that's you and I as believers in Christ, offer the sacrifice. Offer up the, the giving of an offering to God. What are we to give a sac sacrifice to? Look back, if you would, at the second thing in verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice. Let us give an offering to God as a believer in Christ. Well, what are we to give? Look at the next thing he says, of praise. The sacrifice that you and I are to give, it's not of an animal. It's not the blood of animals. It's not the blood of a goat or a bull or the, the blood of a dove. It's not those things that we're to sacrifice. We are to give the sacrifice of what? Praise. We Listen to me, church. We have got to learn what it is as believers in Christ to praise Him. We've got to learn what it is to be able to come to church with a liberty, with a freedom to praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
All through the Word of God, you're going to see it's been given to us in the Word of God, specifically in the book of Psalms. You're going to see time after time again given to us that we are to praise Him and how we're to praise Him. But, but can I give you something a little bit before this? He says, let us offer the sacrifice. The sacrifice of what? Of praise. Go with me, if you would, to Psalms chapter 51. Can I show you a man of God that I believe who understood what it was, the matter of praising God by the man of David? And can I give you this this morning? That David in chapter 51 of Psalms, verses 15 through 17, he gives us the attitude of praise. How we're to come about and praise God. See, a lot of times this is the issue. But you know what, you know what will hinder a believer from, from praising God? Pride. Confidence in themselves. Well, those, those things will wreck a believer in being able to praise their God. You look at Psalms chapter 51 with me. And look at verse number 15 down to verse number 17 as David gives us the attitude of praise. He says, O oh Lord... He says, open thou my lips. The word open means loosen and let it go. He said, let me be able to praise you with my mouth, with my lips. He says, oh Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth or declare thy praise. The word praise here means to celebrate or to boast or to sing hymns. He says, let me open my lips that my mouth can show forth or declare your praise and celebrate you. Verse 16, for thou desirest not sacrifice. He says, God, I know you don't desire the sacrifices of animals anymore, of bull. Hey, look what he says. He says, if so, I would give it. But thou delightest not in burnt offering. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices or the offerings of God are what? A broken spirit. Folks, if you and I can learn what it is to truly praise Him, we must understand to truly praise Him, you and I must come with a broken spirit. You know what the word broken there means? It means destroyed. It means crushed. Spirit is the breath inside you and I, the breath that we take. For you and I to truly be able to praise Him biblically, the Bible says this, you and I must come in a form of humility. We must come broken before Him. What? Broken to the understanding of this. Everything that God has given me, I didn't deserve any of it. I didn't deserve the salvation. It was God's love, the reason I have salvation. The things that I have today, the health that I have today, it's not because of what I deserve, it's what God's given to me. It's His mercy and it's grace being bestowed upon me. The house I get to go to after this is a blessing given to me, not because of what I've done, because of what God's done for me. The car I get to get into, the wife that I have, the children I have, everything that I do, it's not mine. It's because of Him. And David said, I've got to learn to praise him with my mouth. I want to praise him. With my lips, I want to praise him. I want to honor him. I want to give the sacrifice of praise. I want to offer that unto him. David said, I want to love him, but he, had, he understood. But I can't come to him unless I come with a broken spirit. Look what he continues to say. A broken and a contrite heart. You know what that word contrite there means? It means collapsed. Humility, fallen. He said, I've got to come with a collapsed heart, which is our intellect. It's our emotions. You know what he's basically saying? You can't come and praise me correctly until you come in a spirit of humility and brokenness. To fall before him and say, God, I didn't deserve any of it. But oh, it's because of your goodness, because of your mercy and your grace and your love that I can sit here today. And the only one I can praise is you and you alone. Because God, you're the only one that's good. You look and you continue to see as David gives us here the attitude. He says, in a contrite heart, oh God, he says, thou won't despise that. You know what that means? I mean, God accepts those of us as believers that will come to him broken. Those that will come with that contrite and that collapsed heart to fall at his feet and say, God, I'm not worthy of any of it. God, I just got, I just got to come and just tell you. I don't deserve salvation, but thank you for giving it to me. I don't deserve the home that I have, but thank you for giving it to me. I don't deserve the health that I have, but thank you for giving it to me. All the things that you give to the family that's sitting next to me, to the wife, to the husband, to the children, to the grandchildren, to the job, to everything you give me, I don't deserve any of it, but God, I only got it because of you. And I just got to come, and I'm just coming broken before you and saying, God, I love you, and thank you. You know, one of those most forsaken things in the churches are today, I believe it's on my heart, soul, body, and mind, is this area right here. 
the altar? You know why that is? Because it's hard, I believe, for Christians to truly humble themselves. To get to that place of a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. And to fall at his feet and listen to me and just be able to praise him. Just be able to become and just to fall at his feet and just say, God, I just want to say thank you and praise him. David gave it to us. We had a man back home, and my wife can tell you this, and I won't tell you the man's name. He was at our church in Waco. And when we went first to the church, you know, I was used to being in Baptist churches where we all sit. And I remember that in the service in particular, they were singing a song, the choir was singing. And all of a sudden, this dude jumps up and begins running around the church. And I'm thinking, oh man, what kind of church do we get to be a part of? And he's running around the church the best that he could. You could tell he had a little bit of some health issues running around. And I came to realize the man's story and understand the story that he had some tremendous, tremendous health issues and had some tremendous victories. And he just couldn't help. I had a chance to talk to him afterwards and get to know him. My wife got to know him and his family, the sweetest couple you ever want to meet in the world. And here's what he told me is this. I remember him telling me this so clear. As he told me one day when I was sitting there talking to him, he said, he said Brother Doug, I told him, I said, man, you get up and you run around. He said, I just love to praise my Lord. He said, and I want to take every opportunity I can to praise him because I don't know when he's going to take me home. And until then, he said, I want to praise him. And I'd watch the services, man, we'd be singing. He'd get up and sometimes, Brother Ricky, there'd be times that he didn't feel well. But he would get up and he would walk and maybe just walk around. And he's just, he wasn't making a show to anybody. You know what he learned? He learned this, what it was to humble himself and just to praise his God. Just to be able to offer up the, the sacrifice of praise and say, God, thank you for another day of life. Thank you that you give me another day of health that I can come together with other believers and praise you and sing the hymns of heaven and to be able to be taught the word of God. Thank you that you give me another day on life. Some of us in here are so blessed. God's been so good. We can't even give him a holy grunt. Oh, that we would examine ourselves and look at ourselves, church, and ask ourselves this question, what it is to offer up the sacrifice of praise to a God who is so worthy of it today. Can I give these to you? Go with me if you would, and these will all be in the book of Psalms. Can I give you Psalms chapter number 100 and verse number 4? Psalms 100, I want you to listen to verse number 4. He says this, Enter. That means to go or to come. That means you have to make an effort. You've got to put forth something as a believer in Christ. He says, enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving, adoration. And into his courts with praise, singing the hymns. Thankful unto him. And look what the rest part says. And bless his name, his authority, his character, his kindness, and his favor. You know what that word bless there means at the end of verse number four? And to bless his name. The word bless there means this. It means to kneel before him. If you study that out, the word blessed there means to come and to kneel before him and to praise him. To kneel at his feet and just say, God, I'm coming to you today just to say thank you. I'm coming today to just fall at your feet to thank you. Look at what you would, Psalms chapter 107. Psalms 107, verse number 21. Here in Psalms 107, verse 21, the psalmist says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, His kindness, and His mercy, and for His wonderful works to the children of men. How many of you can say amen to the fact that God is good today? He's kind, He is merciful. You have experienced that. And it says for His wonderful works. You know what that phrase wonderful works there means? It means His miracles, those things that He's accomplished. It means answered prayers. How many of you can say today, God's answered a prayer in my life? How many of you say that God has worked and shown a miracle in my life? And how many testify, you know what the Bible says? He says, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. And the word there to praise, it says, oh, that men would praise. It means this, it means a lifting of the hands and worshiping him. It means being able to hold up hands and saying, God, I surrender. God, I'm nothing without you. That's what, that's what it means right there, folks, when he's talking here in Psalms 107, verse number 21. When he says this, oh, that men would praise the men and women, a believer in Christ, can hold up their hands and say, God, I'm coming before you today. So unworthy, but only worthy because of what you have done for me. And I'm coming to you today with arms held up high to just say, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, and I love you. 
You look with me if you would. Psalms chapter 136 with me. Verse number 1. Psalms 36 verse 1. He says, Oh, give thanks. Again, the holding of the hand, praising Him unto the Lord. For He is good. Why? For His mercy, His favor endureth for how long? Forever. He's a faithful God, folks. Look with me if you would. Go back if you would to Psalms chapter 135. Verses number 1 and verse number 3. Psalms 135 once says, Praise ye the Lord. Boast or celebrate the Lord. Praise the name. His authority, His character of the Lord. Praise Him, O you servants of the Lord. You know who has a responsibility to praise Him? You and I as a believer. We're the ones that are called out to praise Him. Verse number 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto His name. Celebrate Him in song, for it is what? Pleasant. It is sweet and delightful in His ears. God loves to hear the praises of His people, folks. That's when you and I just fall before Him and thank Him. He loves to hear us praise Him in our voices and being able to sing to Him, being able to honor Him in song and lifting up our voice and singing truths to Him. Look with me, if you would, Psalms 147. Verse number 1. He says, Psalms 147, Praise you the Lord, both celebrate, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is pleasant and praise. Being able to come in music is what? It's comely, it's suitable, it's beautiful for Him. He's worthy of praise, folks, for you and I to come to Him. Go back, if you would, to Psalms chapter 117. I'd like to read the whole chapter to you. And don't be fearful. This is the smallest chapter in the Bible. All right? That's good trivia. All right? Smallest, smallest chapter in the Bible. Psalms 117. Verse number 1, listen to what he says. Oh, praise, boast the Lord. You know what the Lord is? It's the eternal Jehovah. Same yesterday, today, and forever. All ye nations, the word nations there is talking about people and Gentiles in particular. Praise Him, all ye people. For His merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Man. And then lastly, if you go with me to the last chapter in the book of Psalms, the greatest chapter on praise I want to read the entire chapter to you, six verses. And I want you to hear what the Bible says to us in closing in the matter of praise. He says, praise you the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary, in His place. Praise Him in the firmament or the sky of His power and His strength. Praise Him for His mighty acts or the victory He's given. Praise Him according to His excellent or abundant greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and heart. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. The Bible there in that word praise simply means to shine, to be clear, to boast, to celebrate, to glory, and to sing. The sacrifice of praise. You and I as a believer in Jesus Christ, you listen to me, have an awesome responsibility to give the offering of praise, of thanksgiving, of praising our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Heavenly Father continually, all the time, over and over and over again, never stopping. Oh, that we at a church would understand the great importance that we have in the great opportunity and privilege to be able to kneel at His feet and just to praise Him. Not ask Him for anything. Praise Him. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. It's amazing how many people God's placed in mine and my wife's life that have showed us what it is to praise Him. You praise Him in the good times. You praise Him in the bad times. You praise Him when it's easy. And you praise Him when it's hard. You praise Him when it's great. And you praise Him when it looks impossible. Because I'm going to tell you what, He is always the same and never changes. He is so absolutely worthy of mine and your praise. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to this time to turn this invitation over to you, Father. Work in hearts and lives of all that are here today. May we learn what it is, God, to truly come and to just fall at your feet and praise you. 
at all times, nonstop, Lord, just praising you for your goodness to us. Praising you for the storms you allow us to go through and the storms you've brought us through, the victory that you have given to us. Oh, you've been so good and you're so worthy. We pray this invitation over work in the hearts and lives of people. If there's one here today that may not know Christ as their Savior, may not know where they would spend eternity, I pray that they may come during this invitation. Let us take the Bible and show them how they too can accept that wonderful gift of salvation. If there are those here this morning that would like to come and join us here at South Valley Baptist Church, have gone through the new members class and completed that, and if they'd like to come and join, they can come to their, during this time. I'll meet them down front. But Father, we turn this invitation over to you at this time. Work in the hearts and lives of your people today. We ask these things in Christ's name. I ask you to stand on your feet.